respected dignitaries present over here, dear parents, my dear students, online viewers, press and electronic media, a very good morning to one and all, a warm welcome to today's popular lecture sessions. This is Srinu Apikonda, curator at this museum, will be coordinating this session. So before we get into the session, so let me uh, introduce the topic. Today we have the topic, uh, application of DNA technology in medicine, forensic science, forensics, followed by hands-on activity on mitotic chromosomes. And recent times we all witnessed uh, during the pandemic time, how biotechnology helped out to mitigate the very big issue, especially uh, tracking of the SARS-CoV-2 with the genomic surveillance, followed by vaccines, designs, and fit tense vaccine arrival and all this. So this is how biotechnology has been helping us, yet there are many issues to be addressed, and biotechnology is, is uh, in the area of biotechnology, we have been trying to overcome these issues. So to highlight the utility and uses of the DNA technology, so we have today with us Professor Navaran Goes. We are extremely happy to have him with us and we are delighted to have him as a here guest speaker. And before we proceed, let me introduce a small bio data of the Professor Navaran Goes. Dr. Navaran Goes is serving as a Professor of Biology and Advisor for Biology Education in the West Texas A&M University, Canyon and adjacent professor at the Department of Environmental Toxicology, Texas Tech University, Lubbock, Texas. He obtained two PhD degrees, PhD in Cytogenetics, Botany, from the University of Calcutta, India, and also PhD in Biology from the University of North Texas, Denton. He had postdoctoral experience from the Baylor College Medicine, Houston. He has been teaching at the West Texas and a &M University for the 22 years. He is involved in research for 32 years. His postdoctoral research involved ultrastructural studies using in-situ hybridization, immunocytochemical labeling with the transmission electron microscopy. He taught at the University of North Texas, Richland College, Dallas, and South Texas College, Texas. Dr. Goh's research area is rather vast. Applications of nanotechnology and biotechnology, cytogenetics, plant pathology, virology, mycology, uh, allergic and pathogenic pathogenic fungi, electron microscopy, tissue culture, aerobiology, air and water quality. He has collaboration with uh, Penn State, Cornell University, Texas Tech, UNT, and USDA labs. He has published 150 and more research articles in the reputed uh, scientific journals. A book chapter on uh, allergy and uh, allergen immuno immunotherapy from CRC Press, uh, New York, 2017, it was released. So he served as the president for the Texas Society for the Microscopy. He is a member for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and 15 other scientific societies. So he, he, he presented his research nationally and internationally all over the world. Dr. Gose has received 12 awards from the West Texas and AM University and Texas AM University system. Distinguished Graduate Faculty Award 2007, the Atibury Honors Medical 2016-2019 and the Texas AM and University Systems, Chancellor's Teaching Excellence Award in 2010 and 2011 and these are all his credits. So with this note, I would like to now request our Director, uh, BA, uh, Director BATM, Sri Subrata Saudari sir, to welcome Professor Navaran Ghosh with a flower book. Right, thank you. Thank you. May I now request Director B. Atum to felicitate Professor Navaran Goes with a small Thank 
May I now request Director BATM, Sufrata Saudri sir, to deliver welcome address. Thank you, Srinu. It is really a privilege to have with us uh, Professor Navarun Ghosh, a very renowned professor in the field of biological sciences, especially in the uh, United States of America. And also, uh, I take the opportunity of welcoming him, not only he being the, one of the you know brightest scientists, but also being one of my closest friends, because we are from the from, from the same school. Uh, I welcome the students, the parents, uh, those who have joined with us online, the media, and everybody who are present here, and also the distinguished guests to this program. Uh, Builder Industrial and Technological Museum is the oldest science museum in the country under the Government of India. And as a part of our science popularization, very recently we have added two new wings. One is Innovation Hub, the other one is the Biotechnological Labs. And it is one of the rarest facilities, the only one of its kind in the Eastern Zone. And oh, since its beginning, it has become one of the you know, important hubs of scientific activities of not only of the members but also of the college students of the lo locality. As a part of this program, we often call the uh, scientists to share their views with, uh, with the students, with the members, so that they can cover, cover exact, you know, uh, uh, exact careers in future. Because there was a time when we were students, we used to think that those who are not very comfortable with uh, mathematics, it is better for them to pursue a career in biological sciences. Or if you have very special affiliation towards that subject, you can join. But things have changed quite a lot. If you see the trend of Nobel Prizes in the recent years, you will find that most of the Nobel Prizes own in the category of chemistry are from those people who have pursued their life in the biological sciences. Science is now completely as a whole. And just I am giving you one example. How many of you know about a very, you know, deadly disease, Alzheimer? Just raise your hand. Yeah. So, now scientists, the biological scientists are trying to solve this problem because this is a very it is coming in a very menacing way. Last two years we have seen COVID. It was really out of bound. But now just take it from me that mental illness is going to be one of the major challenges for the scientific fraternity of this region. And Alzheimer is one of the major diseases which is coming. Now do you know how the scientists, the medical scientists are trying to handle it? They are trying to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision and all the things. So today's students who are aspiring to take a career in that direction, they must know something of statistics, something of computer, something of physics, something of you know, chemistry, everything. So this is what is in store for all of you. I wish that, uh, that today's talk by Professor Ghosh will give you a new direction. And at this backdrop, I will request Dr. Ghosh to go straight into the today's presentation and also spend a part of your presentation uh, in career counseling. With that, I thank you all. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Choudhury, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Navarun Ghosh, and uh, you can ask questions during discussion in English or Bengali, doesn't matter. Uh, we studied science in Bengali, and I'll give you a little introduction on, like, um, as Subhabrata said, 
like we are from hair school calcutta so we shared uh, the same experience and i was discussing before entering into the lift over there um, that Subhabrato and I, at one point, four of the students were selected from hair school, and fortunately, we were there, and we came to BITM here, and watched the video, and there are lots of good learning that almost changed our life. So uh, that's one part, and then the second part, uh, I would share like my good friend, Dr. Mukherjee, is here, with whom I got my bachelor's. Uh, he was my colleague at the time, bachelor of science, then. A master of science and first PhD. I got it over there. So with that, I'll, as uh, the honorable director, talk about. I am very thankful to him, and then also Srinu, who just took the trouble to organize all the time. Called in, uh, called USA because the time zone is different and organized. This. So with that, I'll directly get into uh, the talk. The reason I put the first slide here, as you see, uh, Rosalind Franklin inspiring and career it's extremely important sometimes scientists did not receive the recognition that's why i put the slide here and put the picture of the lady rosalind franklin um, if you read more in the book called double helix i insist you that you uh, read that i purchased that from washington seattle uh, from a conference with only three dollars and that's a nice read it's a uh, little book and it's not too much of science, but it's almost autobiography of James D. Watson. All of you know the name Watson and Creek. Watson is writing, if Rosie, like Rosalind Franklin, used a little bit lipstick, she would appear much better. But anyway, um, she was a dedicated scientist who discovered, who first time put that idea that DNA is a double helix model. That was a big deal at that time because people did not know the DNA structure from X-ray diffraction pattern, she just discovered it. And you can find the picture uh, signed by Rosalind Franklin on the side. It's kind of brownish because it's old. On the Google search, you will find it. But unfortunately, she did not receive any recognition. Using that model, James D. Watson and Crick and Maurice Wilkins, they received the Nobel Prize. But um, you know, she did not receive any recognition. Sometimes it happened, and all of we know, like the name of uh, Professor Bose, Shotten Bose, we know, and we celebrated uh, her, uh, his birthday over there, and it was interesting thing. His students came over there at UNT and talked about uh, the genius. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So again, James D. Watson and Francis Crick, all of you know uh, Francis Crick, Crick passed away, but James Watson is still there. He's alive and very active. And uh, so I was reviewing, I was fortunate to review one of his book on gene. And I was reading, I mean, how knowledgeable that person could be to write about everything on DNA in only 20 pages in that chapter. So James D. Watson, who also served uh, as the director of the Human Genome Project. Uh, Kerry Mullis very recently passed away, but uh, again, one major discovery all of us know because of COVID, all of us know about RT PCR. Okay, so the PCR, the technique, was discovered by Kerry Mullis. And if you read the history of discovery, very, very interesting. Okay, how he discovered, how he got the idea, how you can increase the temperature, lower it down, and then you know, break the DNA strand and then basically multiply, amplify, amplification of DNA sequences. And that's what we use in using the reverse transcriptase, which we call RT-PCR. Everybody knows about that today because of COVID. Next one, please. So polymerase chain reaction, as I mentioned, there are a few steps. Firstly, it would be denaturation. The DNA template is denatured with a high heat, so it's basically getting separated. The next step is annealing. Each DNA primer anneals, binding to the complementary sequence of the template DNA. Next one. Extension. DNA polymerase creates a new strand of DNA complementary to the template DNA starting from the primer. Now, here, that's the point I want to share with you because I'm sure from this room many of you will go in science and do the research. 
Now, science is kind of those who did the research, it's kind of fighting with frustration. You may not get result instantly, okay? Kerry Mullis was trying and trying, and he did not get any result because the last step I mentioned, if you remember, DNA polymerase, that synthesizes the DNA strand, okay? So now, you need DNA polymerase, but remember, I talked about heating and cooling. Instantly, you heat it up, then you cool it down, right? Now, if you heat it up, what happens to the enzyme? What are the enzymes? Anybody can tell what's the nature? Is that protein? Yeah, very good. Everybody knows that's protein. So that get denatured when you heat up, right? So none of the enzyme was working. DNA polymerase he collected from everywhere, all the organisms, nothing worked. Then he remembered, that's why if you want to be a complete scientist, just like uh, Mr. Choudhury was telling, it's a lots of science and math now. You know, biology, you have to learn lots of math. Statistics application is there. So it's not outside of math. In the same way, like Kerry Mullis went to visit uh, Yellowstone National Park, where his friend pointed to some bacteria they were growing in, with a very high temperature, beyond 100 degrees Celsius, thermophilus bacteria. And that he extracted the the last step, the DNA polymerase, DNA pol, we call it, DNA pol as he extracted from that bacteria, thermophilus, and he was successful. See, I just wanted to show you that's not just telling you most of you know all these things, but at what what point, if in the research you get stuck, you can go, you can start thinking beyond your area. Okay, next one, please. Thank you. I want to mention, as my lecture is covering also application of biotechnology in medicine, the first and big discovery when there were earlier other discoveries, you know the story about the discovery of uh, penicillin, everybody knows Alexander Fleming. But here, Genentech, their discovery saved the lives of billions all over the world, those who suffer from diabetes discovery of synthetic or genetically engineered insulin was a epoch making discovery uh, in the area of medical science because if you read the history people all of you know about diabetes right so that's basically your glucose level go up because of insulin you need sometimes you have to provide external insulin at that time before this discovery the source of insulin was animals dogs pigs and serologically we are different we are human being so there are many reactions many of the patients even died because of that insulin uh, you know injected from other sources so this is the first time and I'll give you more idea a little bit about how this was done Genentech in San Francisco, California. That still now, every year they have uh, discoveries, new and new discoveries, vaccines they are doing. So they did interesting work and saved the world from, you know, particularly the diabetic patients from the, you know, discovery of genetically engineered insulin. So recombinant DNA technique, as I mentioned, the first thing they use uh, in the next picture, you will see there's a circular structure extra genomic covalently closed circular dna which we call basically the plasmid and it's a circular one so if you think about bacterial cell they have just simple genome right they don't have any covered chromosome or nucleus it's not there so we call it genophore or nucleoid sometimes bacterial chromosome loosely but besides that they also have a ring-like structure which we call plasmid and plasmid was the major tool in the hand of biotechnologists. So I try to simplify for that students, it is just like your backpack, okay? So I gave you like say this water bottle, some pens and pencils and papers and books, and I asked you to carry it to other room. What would be the easy, easiest way? You put all of those in a backpack and then carry it. Plasmid is the backpack where you can insert the gene, you can cut and rejoin the DNA sequences and then put that in the cell which will change the character of the cell. We'll see that in the coming slides. So 
that's the chart simply telling as you start from looking at the left side the plasmid I was talking about and if you take the foreign DNA we are talking about you can get the DNA insulin synthesizing DNA with gene which we call IN gene for insulin and that was cut and cut with the restriction endonuclease enzyme and rejoined with that ring. The ring was rejoined with the insulin plasmid. That was, now you have recombinant plasmid and that was inserted, that was inserted in the uh, bacterial cell. The nice thing about the bacterium, they share their information, their genes with others, other neighbors. So they multiplied, they multiplied that plasmid, genetically engineered plasmid, and shared with the billions of other friends bacteria. So it goes multiplication, and then, remember they have insulin, so if you provide their nutrient, they will synthesize the insulin, you know, the chemical, the hormone, insulin will be secreted by those bacteria. And that would be collected, purified, bottled, and marketed as Humana and all those, you know, names, trade names. But that was really a big discovery. First time we could see you can change that and you can utilize in the area of medicine. Just a little bit history mentioning. Earlier when this was demonstrated by Harman Muller that we can change, we can change the genes in the organism, particularly in Drosophila, the fruit fly. He showed that. And in Texas, UT Austin, we have still now his fly lab is there. Um, you can visit if you go. So he first time demonstrated, okay? He was a disciple of another Nobel laureate, T.H. Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan, who basically uh, worked with sex-linked inheritance. Going back, that discovery when it was done, if you change the color of fruit fly, how does it help to human being? Sometimes the discoveries are there, as you read in the history, you think like, well, it doesn't have anything to do with human. But maybe 30, 40, 50 years after, that will be utilized for producing vaccine. In the history of mankind, in the history of medical science, first time in almost one year, few months, the vaccine was made against COVID-19. Day and night, all the scientists working. So, again, repeating that, so that knowledge, Harman Muller found using the X-ray, you can change the gene. The same knowledge was used by the renowned, world-renowned scientist, Norman Bordeaux. All of you know the name because he received the highest civilian order uh, you know uh, from the government of India five other countries he also received Nobel Prize Norman Borla what did he do he passed away in 2010 when Dallas Morning News focused man passed away who fed billions if you look at the data in agricultural data production and everything we would not be able to survive with the production we had 1960s. And he developed the Sharbati Shonara, the variety, Mexican wheat variety that produced three times of grains. Remember, three times of grains. And he did this technique for all other like legumes and others. So briefly, that's how science develops from basic research. So basic research is extremely important before you go to applied aspects. I already talked about Kerry Mullis, next one, PCR, and I think it's repeated, then, okay, we got that. Now, I'm getting into gene and markers. What are the markers? Now, present day world is changing. So many things are happening, and you have the DNA barcoding technique, and if the gene of interest is not known, marker linked to the gene of interest can still be used to select for individuals with desirable alleles of the gene of interest. I'll give you a little example, then you will understand. Um, the director was talking about Alzheimer's. And so many of the diseases and disorders, 
can be caused by the genes, although in case of Alzheimer's is 31 mutations. But many other disease causing genes, if you can target in the cell, I personally work a little bit on that, you have to tag, this is called tagging. And you can use another gene for chemical tagging or you can do radioisotope tagging, which will fluoresce in the dark, telling that that gene is there. So that we call as marker gene. So what the genetic markers are showing over here, as you can see, beautiful array of the, you know, uh, the, the shapes over there. So I will discuss a little bit about, as Srinu asked me, what kind of equipment we use for that, ASDS gel electrophoresis, which has gone further. Now we have computerized SDS gel electrophoresis. So you can get those kinds of bars over there. What does it tell you? It tells you that each and every sample is different here if you look at. Each and every sample is different and they have these bars. And these bars representing the particular type of marker. Each and every species we have that kind of bars. So DNA barcoding, as you can read the history a little more, and then basically that is done, I can give you the idea, like a major work is done at UBC, University of British Columbia. Um, I went for their training of DNA barcoding. They have unique collection of materials. You'll be surprised to know how many types of chili papers, including what we call in Bengali the little dhani longa, and the big one, all types of capsicums they have. So they did the barcoding over there for each and every species, and they started working on it. That's in agriculture or forestry, that area. But that's also extremely important in medical science. Like to understand the disorder, much better way scientists started using DNA barcoding. At one point, you will have personalized DNA barcoding, which will tell about your uh, diseases disorder but it is not it is not done practically in the market yet because people are thinking about privacy issues so next one please I was discussing about microbiome microbiome microflora can be changed in few days that can make you sick okay so microflora if you look at there are lots of work being done and as you do data mining I'm talking about you need to go to NCBI, National Center for Biotechnology Information, and you will find all kinds of information. You are, nowadays, you are digitally very smart. All you have to do, you know, and go to PubMed and search for COVID. You get all the information from there. So what kind of numbers, as you see, in our large intestine, we have 33,627 species of bacteria. I have eminent uh, gastroenterologist who did work with me in the USA as well, Dr. P. Banerjee. He can tell you more about in our gut microflora what's happening and what's going on over there. In our mouth, you'll be surprised to know that 7,400 or more bacterial species are there. I'm just sharing that idea, like I remember uh, during our microbiology class, Dr. Chandra, uh, he asked to make the slide from our own mouth swab or something like that. That's the only night I didn't brush my teeth. And next day morning when I made the slide, name it, Spirochetes and everything, everything, thank you. Everything was there, all kinds of species, and my slide was really good, you know, because, so now it tells you if you don't wash our mouth properly, that can create a mess. Our microflora will get bad and different bad types of, you know, species of bacteria can start multiplying, cause you more disease. So that is extremely important. Next one, please. Recombinant DNA technology, I already talked about that. And so basic idea is variable number of genes. And you can utilize the technique in various ways. Like even controlling the environmental pollution, we never thought about. Dr. A. M. Chakraborty, Ananda Mohan Chakraborty, first time in uh, early 90s, 92, 93, he worked on, he developed what he called superbug. What he did, he just cut and rejoined the plasmid I talked about, 
and he inserted some genes that can digest away benzene, toluene and different types of chemicals. Now when he made the superbug, this superbug as you put in the polluted water, the bacterial species will survive on that water, they will eat away or analyze, you know, basically degrade that biochemical compound and make the water pollution free. That was excellent work. The same kind of work in, is done in various areas. That brings a question, if we think about, you can do good with a, that kind of tool, plus meat, in the hand of biotechnologists. Can you do bad? You can do worse thing. Okay, worse thing you can do. That's what, you know, back 90s, we got the term bioterrorism. Okay, and what you can do, I'm just giving you an example with this recombinant DNA technology. How about if you, well, don't try if you have access, okay? Um, if you just make a bacterial species that you put 10 times concentration of antibiotic and the bacteria, uh, they are still surviving on that. I did that in my hand, of course, we burned it out after autoclaving because it is uh, not desirable that you release that kind of strain that will destroy the human. So basically you cut and rejoin. What we did, you cut and rejoin that plus meat and we put STR. STR stands for streptomycin resistant gene. And we inserted that in the plus meat. The plus meat multiplied 80 times because of scanning and everything we, we could find biochemical scanning we could find it and it started producing str resistant and it survived as we put streptomycin put the bacteria in the plate they survive happy think of it happens to the human society and unfortunately in a knowledgeable biologist a biotechnologist or microbiologist they can design a superbug that will kill the whole human species, like in maybe months or years, like we have seen what happened during COVID. So it is doable, that is called bioterrorism. So that's also a scary part uh, in the hand of mankind. Next slide, please. This I wanted to show you exactly. Very interesting thing about transfer of gene. What they called it as gene juggling. Very interesting thing. So. Firefly luciferase gene, which routinely we isolate as a tagging gene, it was transferred, remember, from firefly, arthropods, insects. It was transferred to the tobacco plant, tobacco plant, Nicotiana tabacum, and it started glowing in the dark when you supply ATP, because ATP is for all the energy, right? So it started glowing in the dark. Apparently, you will think about, well, it's kind of magic, but it's what's the applied aspect. Remember I mentioned once the things are done, it is noted other people learn that and in applied area they utilize. Next one, please. So that's, that was done my, by my graduate students in the lab. What they did here, uh, they basically used a membrane here to collect the colonies that was transformed. Transform means that was inserted with firefly gene. So firefly insect to totally different area, monera, prokaryotes, in bacteria, it was transferred and they started glowing in the dark when you put them under UV light. E. coli never glows, otherwise we could see each and every one's intestine very clearly <laughs> outside in the dark. So that kind of work is done. It is a standard laboratory technique. Next one, please. So you have lots of application. I'm just focusing a little bit on human genome project that revolutionized the area of medicine and biotechnology. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. James D. Watson was leading that. 2003, first time, the first transcript of that was released. And later, the research is going on continuously. It basically deciphered lots of area that was not known, that was not known. Like, think about the jumping gene. Jumping gene, when it was discovered back 1938 in the Cold Spring Harbor lecture, Dr. Barbara McClintock, she mentioned about the jumping gene. Some of the genes can jump from one part of the chromosome to another, or it can jump from one organism to another. 
and she called that as transposon. Guess what happened the next? Uh, in the report, everybody ridiculed her, said, this women with hysteria. <laughs> you know, she was ridiculed a lot till 1960s, long time. 1960s, other scientists discovered copia and other types of transposons. It was discovered in human. And unfortunately, many of the transposons are related with causing cancer. So a transposon, think about you have a big chromosome. One part you have a gene, it starts jumped on the other side and it started controlling the expression of gene. What will happen? Total gene expression will be changed and it can start carcinogen, tumorigenesis and carcinogenesis. So considering that, one of the world-renowned cancer biologists, Dr. Bart Vogelstein, at Johns Hopkins, he was working on that and he found that we are so much fragile, so more you learn it's bad, it's frustrating. That you have the genes which are so much fragile, it can move from one place to another place, it can change the expression. So 2015 he published a paper titled as, you have bad luck, that's why you got cancer. Even in Anandavajar Putrika, I found that it was highly criticized all over the world, scientific world, you know, talking about this paper and what kind of, you know, person is that? Because they thought with the other angle. They were thinking like a cancer patient, think about he or she is lying down on the bed and watching the TV and found that this, because bad luck, you got this cancer. But what he meant to say that sometimes it happens for no reason, the transposon moving from one side to another side and it start causing cancer. So that can happen also. So let's go, um, now, sorry, go back, go back to the previous slide. All of you know this diagram very well. Uh, and what it's showing that homology, homology between human and other organism, like they are talking about Drosophila melanogaster, C. elegans, worm, and then yeast cells, the yeast, the regular bread making yeast, that's a big genetic model nowadays. All these are genetic models. So at Baylor College of Medicine, when I visited my um, colleague who also graduated from the same lab, his human genetics laboratory. So I expected some human is lying down and <laughs> doing the work or something. I just went over there and he was working on big thing like breast cancer, estrogen and all those. I said, where is your material? He said, oh, in, these, in the cabinets. What are those? Yeast culture. That's what he was doing. So yeast can be used as genetic model for cancer gene you can transfer. You'll be surprised to know a weed, little tiny weed, Arabidopsis thaliana. You can transfer the gene and you can get the result from there. So unique things are happening since we cannot use human species for experimentation and that's not logical. So basically, all these genetic models are used, mouse, drosophila, and uh, yeast, Arabidopsis, all these are used. Next one, please. So this is just giving you the idea. I'm sure all of you know about our chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes, 23 pf, and all of you know the X and Y, X and X, uh, determines the sex of female and X and Y for the male. Everybody knows about that. So now in the cell you have the chromosomes. If you look at the chromosome, it is a very complicated structure. Super coiled with the DNA and there are unique structure called nucleosome. And they are controlling everything, almost everything, what we do, our health and everything. Next one please. So the Human Genome Project, it was led by Dr. James D. Watson. I, as I mentioned, the first print came out, 2003. Next one, please. Area, where we can basically utilize the knowledge. The first one, as you can see, diagnostics. Lots of work be, is being done. In one slide in the later, I'll talk about how it was utilized in cancer biology to cure cancer, yes, 
evolutionary studies comparing the species as I mentioned like you have to know about all the aspects you never know which knowledge you will utilize to put it in applied aspect to do good to the mankind so evolutionary genomics and everywhere population genetics and what kind of genomic organization is there lots of knowledge you have and you'll find that in CBI, National Center of Biotechnology Information, you'll get tons of information over there. That's one site you will get lots of information to deal with. And knockout mice, on which we, I personally worked on. So knockout mice, basically, you knock out a gene, disable that gene, and then that mouse does not have that gene, and we study what kind of disability is developing. Interestingly enough, with the nine universities and medical centers, we had collaboration. So some of the physicians, they were interested. They found in human, in little kids, there are lots of different disorders, like familial dysautonomia, neurological disorders. So how we can correlate, how we can study. So you are looking at what kind of genes are responsible for that kind of disorder. So it was done with the Texas, Ch Texas Children's Hospital in University of Houston. So today's research is not alone. Research is a group, a team of 50 scientists, medical doctors, all of them work together to get into uh, you know, the area. Next one. So this is just a rough idea how we can do the gene mapping if you study more like say from one little part of the chromosome. We call it centimorgan, CM for centimorgan. That's how we measure the distance. And finally everybody knows the sequence, A, T, G, C, that's what we get the sequence. And we have the DNA sequencer. I'll show you the picture at this next one. Very interesting work by Rockefeller scientist. Sometimes you see that one person who is eating a lot but remains skinny like this mouse another person just eating very little but become you know fatty and the thing is everything is now we find it's gene control phenomenon because all of us know that obesity leads to lots of different types of disorders so that work was very interesting they're talking about a genetic switch the switch that is in the mouse that is working like that and uh, in fact in our laboratory also we worked on I still remember those you know uh, fatty mouse uh, as you put those mice over there they sit over there for the whole day you know it's, it's very easy to work with them because they don't move much but the little tiny ones you know about mice how they behave one day just our one particular genetic genetically categorized mouse that just escaped the lab Dr. Rami Rosalas and myself, we are just running to chase that. Because if it goes to another laboratory and it fertilizes and then all the genes will be messed up. So you cannot let it go. Next one. So this work was done, in fact, one of my colleagues was there and she sent me, Jennifer sent me this uh, picture where first time the fog, it was glowing, the hair started glowing in the dark in the mice. Now, some of my students, they asked, when they are releasing in the pet smart so that you can purchase and get a pet. It's not for pet. They, they spend five million dollars to get that work. Now this is again I was targeting, uh, you know, talking about the target gene, marker gene. So this is one type of marker they can use for genetic research. Next one. I was talking about this work like as it was designed in our life, uh, you know, in the lab, like alpha-3 gene and I worked on compensatory mechanism that was recorded in the sympathetic ganglia of alpha-3 knockout mice. Simply I'm trying to explain it. So basically we have ganglia, a number of nerves get together, right? So what I was trying to look at when one gene is muted or not working, interestingly enough, the other gene started working more. Just like somebody does not, you know, cannot see, they can hear, hearing power gives, goes up. The vice versa. The same kind of thing happens in the genetic world. One gene is not working, the other one will compensate and that is called compensatory mechanism. First time we reported in the world, we had three publications on that. Next one please. 
this one I specially wanted to focus on. It came out in the news only seven days back. I was watching the BBC news seven days back. And if you read it, base editing, all of us know about all is magic in the DNA structure. It's just the base. Okay, as you look at the base, get changed, everything gets changed. So this um, girl was suffering from a disorder, that uh, blood disorder, okay, leukemia. Now, this is the first time this revolutionary therapy clear gone from cancer. And that's so interesting. And I read that and also listened to that news because this is first time they just edited the bases and inserted those cells. They multiplied and destroyed the cancerous cell or cancer producing cells. Unique work. Just seven day back, the work was being done for long time, of course. But this is first time it was reported. It could be an answer to le leukemia. As all of you know, first time if you read, you see that white blood cells which fight against infection that confer immunity to us. So if we have more soldiers, that would be good, right? So why leukemia is bad and people die? Because they are producing tiny little WBCs. They are functionless. That's why leukemia is bad. So this is first time when it was reported, it was revolutionary. Next one. So I'm talking about few equipment again and going back to some other discussion on DNA barcoding and then finish up my lecture. So the first one is DNA sequencer. First of all, as you get, you have to isolate the DNA, right? You isolate from anything. Nowadays, the machines are there. Um, I was in a workshop in uh, Edmonton, Canada. And this company was you know, selling a, a equipment which looks like mostly like a refrigerator or something like that. But the price was $1 million. And they were selling, they were giving some discount of $200,000 over there. <laughs> so the unique machine can do in 45 to 30, 45 minutes or so, that will analyze your DNA, RNA, or protein, all macromolecules, and give you the printed report and give the DNA barcoding and everything. So nowadays, everything is automated system. What we used to do with the hard work, now it is being changed. So I gave them some strawberry DNA and some insect DNA. And the DNA fingerprinting was done and compared and telling what is that and what is this. Unique thing was done with DNA sequencing. So this is the sequencer that's how it worked. And then uh, you have seen this kind of DNA barcoding picture. So as it is analyzed, and uh, so the DNA sequencer, that can give you how it is organized, like the base, the bases, how they are arranged. If you read more on mutation, point mutation, again, um, as uh, Shubha brother was talking about Alzheimer's, I'm just pointing a little bit idea. It is really frustrating in really knowledgeable person or very smart person developing Alzheimer's, losing the capability, not, you know, start forgetting everything which in my human genetics class, most students start claiming as I talk about Alzheimer's, this, you know, after the class they come, Dr. Ghosh, I think I developed Alzheimer's. <laughs> I said, you study little more, your Alzheimer's will be gone. <laughs> because in the exam time, I also developed Alzheimer's. We used to get forgetting the Latin names and everything. So Alzheimer's actually is a genetic disorder. All of us know. First time it was noted in the 18th century in a um, uh, woman named Hannah. And she was only her 30s. That's a classical dementia, we call it. And it's, she started develop, you know, developing dementia, forgetting everything. The reason I'm telling that, 1983, look at the time, when Hannah's great grandkids, medical doctors, scientists, they collected blood and isolated and found it is responsible, some genes, 31 mutations in the chromosome number 14 very intricate thing, changing the Golgi. Anybody knows about Golgi? What is Golgi? What does Golgi body does? They call dictyosomes. Go ahead, please. Uh, so they help in the formation of Yes. And anything else? Secretion, right? Yeah, just like she mentioned that 
they form the lysosomes and they and release protein modification maybe. yes protein modification right so golgi apparatus camillo golgi discovered it after staining with stannic chloride so these golgi basically secrete the substances we need secretion right bile when you go for lunch you are eating secretion controlled by the you know all these golgi bodies now in our brain cells we have the golgi apparatus think about high, how minute is that they get messed up start secreting more and more a substance called beta amyloid beta amyloid is a substance that fills up the brain cells and it is just like i give the example in your car sometimes it would not start because you see the sulfate you know forms over there and this you know it's not, you are not no electrical impulse is going nowadays if you work with the area of neuroscience you will see all electricity everything is controlled electrically chemically our brain in our brain cells those are stored and instantly we retrieve the information we are still learning in neuroscience so in alzheimer's those are wrapped with brain cells and fissures get wrapped with and filled up with beta amyloid and that started developing alzheimer's now one good thing you will so people are doing lots of research and lots of funding from federal government in united states they are working on it because last 20 years there is 5% increase in alzheimer's okay so that's what i used to teach in the class then i did the google scholar search it's not 5% 17.5% in recent years 17.5 17 people out of 10 i mean out of 100 17 people out of 100 getting alzheimer's it's scary thing more research more work is to be done to save our memories and everything so one good thing as i mentioned that we figured out curcumin found in curcuma longa holut simple holut turmeric those who take turmeric which we do almost every day <laughs> with fish with ra you know everything like meat anything curries we cook in india that dissolves if you take that regularly that dissolves that beta amyloid giving the capacity to fight against alzheimer's long you know so there was a project at baylor college of medicine they were checking if you eat if you take the curcumin which means in curcuma longa holut if you take it three times then they will do the testing with you and they pay good money like 40 dollars an hour for testing so only they were looking for person i qualified for that but i didn't have time to work on that so they were trying to check and now you'll find in the recent years the discoveries show that if you check holud regularly it's just not only medicinal values but i mentioned about uh, alzheimer's next one please so how we can look at the sequences all of you know about when u is there that is your uracil in the rna and DNA, you have that, you know, uh, the sequence ATGC, ATGC, all the time. These are unique symbols of the protein. And as you go to NCBI website, you know what kind of amino acid sequence are produced here. So that's very interesting so that you can recognize that. Next one. PCR, the machine looks like that. The reason I put the picture, I already talked about <coughs> PCR, and we know about RT-PCR. Uh, Dr. Kerry Mullis, CETAS Corporation, he discovered it. Now, when I first time started working in molecular biology back 90s, the PCR machine would occupy this table, this big table. There are boxes connecting with tubes and another box. So heating and cooling, heating and cooling, it, it would require that kind of thing. This one is just like a small grinder or something. And you have 96 wells. So that's why it was possible with the RT-PCR we could get the result of thousands in a day. You know, 100,000 people could be analyzed with the RT-PCR technique because you have 96 wells. The new one coming out, 120. Anyway. So next one. I was talking about SDS page, sodium dodecyl sulfate. So the idea of SDS page, let me explain. According to the molecular weight of the protein, you can run it. You can run it. Say, for example, I was using the backpack 
example, I put in the backpack lots of good things, maybe the table, this, and then I try to put a little computer over there, it's heavy, another book over there. And I ask you to, can you please take it to the door over there or outside the, in the, uh, you know, BITM campus? And you went to the gate and nobody's looking at me, so I drop the heaviest thing, the books over there. Then you go farther, nobody's looking at me, this little smaller stuff you started putting on that. According to the weight, you started dropping, right? Exactly the same thing is done with SDS page. The protein molecules are dropped according to their molecular weight, giving you the bands. That's unique for a particular protein. With the ladder, you compare that and you know the molecular weight of that. So SDS page just revolutionized the area of molecular biology for detection. Next one, please. So again, bioanalyzer, I used in my research and I had a publication. Everything is computerized, as I mentioned. You don't have to go for SDS page now. So what you have to do, you have to have a little chip, which we, which we call DNA chip. And they provide, the biochemical companies, they provide the material, you just insert everything, your sample, like say for DNA or protein or RNA, as you put over there your sample, and you put the particular types of chemicals over there. And then insert that into that computer. And that's it. And let it run, like 45 minutes. You get all the sequencing and everything done, and the DNA fingerprinting is done automatically. Barcoding it is done. Um, I have a paper uh, back 2012, it was, uh, published in Journal of Biotechnology where uh, I showed how the bacteria can change their property and get mutated so they are barcoding getting changed. The same species, remember, they get changed as they get mutated. Next one, please. So DNA barcoding, I'm just skipping that and that's the basic step. You can have insects, plants, fish, anything, isolate the DNA. And we compare that with the international barcode pricing, if you remember that, okay? So that as you scan, so in future it will be there, as you get the barcoding, the DNA, you can scan and you can get your species identification done. Same thing for the disease uh, and the other types of uh, indicating that this kind of disorder is there. Next one. So, the karyotyping is one important technique that is being done in the genetic analysis. The first step is ultrasound, amniocentesis, and then culture of epithelial cell. We can do karyotyping or genetic analysis to find the targeted gene, whether the newborn will have that particular gene or not, disease-causing gene. So that is being done in genetic counseling a lot. Next one, please. Showing the picture just like as you have the human embryo over there, and human embryo location is done, you know, localized with the ultrasound. Then amniocentesis, the fluid is collected where you have the epithelial cells, and that is what is analyzed over there. Next one. So lastly, I just want to focus a little bit on forensic biology because. Uh, forensic files and many other serials in the, on the TV is interesting, but also it changed. Just focus the picture of Dr. Gilking, who was our professor. We learned forensics from him, and he was the director in the Oklahoma bombing case long time back. Next one. So DNA profiling is done in forensics. That's extremely important. There are thousands of cases now being solved by API and also here in India, many work is being done, with isolated DNA is compared from the victim and suspect. Finally, when DNA fingerprinting is matched, then you can tell who, who is the really, you know, the suspect was, you know, uh, as the criminal and determining that. So next one, please. So it is now accepted in US court and DNA fingerprinting has been accepted in the most of the courts of United States. Interesting information I would like to cater. Um, I had a judge came to my human genetics class. That was really weird. I mean, it's kind of elderly guy. But he was taking my human genetics class. 
so I was asking sir what do we need do you need the DNA fingerprinting thing so to become qualified or certified or being promoted you have to have the knowledge of DNA fingerprinting nowadays it's a must you have to attend a workshop you have to attend those classes so he took the class he had little trouble because he took biology maybe in the high school 30 40 years back so anyway interesting thing so federal bureau of investigation or a fbi a law i attended quite a few number of workshops in san antonio and other part so um and there were some cases some of those are really gross pictures i did not put anything here and if you read those like little kid was murdered and that case was unresolved for long time and she did that by DNA fingerprinting found who was the culprit nobody thought about and they escaped that little kid little girl was murdered she was only 12 year old and guess who did that a 14 year old boy 2006 he was kind of really um, uh, a case that was resolved next one so it can be DNA can determine guilt or innocence of the next one PCR general idea, all of you know, Kerry Mullis as he did, that is one thing is done, applied a lot in the area of forensics. Why is that? Because forensics, as you read more, you know, like from the nail, from, you know, other parts like hair, body fluid, all those are collected, right? And then you get very tiny, maybe three, four hairs. So from hair follicle, you get the little DNA. How can you do the work with that kind of little snippet of DNA? PCR. You amplify the DNA sequence? Yes, next one. DNA sequence and then definitely follow the systematic manner. Compare the, you know, how they are matching and uh, then you can definitely uh, find the, the who committed the crime. Next one. So again, human chromosome, there are specific types of, what I mentioned about the marker genes, we have marker genes. And the family, if like in a crime, brothers, two brothers are involved, it will be really difficult to find. So that because of we have particularly what you call familial marker in DNA, which, which you can detect next time. Um, that's another thing I was talking about. You can have your personal barcode. So time to time, the idea is they will upgrade your card based on your health condition. And this will give you all the information. As they scan it in the medical facilities, they can get all the information about it. Next one, please. So sometimes even injustice is corrected. There are lots of evidences like that where um, firstly the accused, or, you know, whoever was there, but they figured out later that um, this person is not responsible for committing the crime. Uh, it was not really DNA work done, but I'm giving you one example, you'll uh, understand that. Forensics is so important, it can save the lives of, you know, uh, the person who did not commit the crime. That was back 92, 93 when this thing happened in the area called Lake Dallas. And <clears throat> the husband died, of course the wife was uh, accused and uh, so she was under law and all other things were pointing to her she was about to i mean you know um, considered as the who committed the crime because that husband just uh, purchased you know some insurance and the wife was nominee so it's pointing to her all the way the forensic biologist they arrived in the case and they found this guy had high amount of cyanide poisoning as all of you know cyanide poisoning so probably the husband uh, the wife fed the cyanide to the husband with the food and, the, and it was very simple came out in dallas morning news and everywhere so forensic biologists when they were testing they found in the stomach lots of crushed apple seeds how many of you know the apple seeds contain 
HCN, hydrocyanic acid. See, all of you know that. Thanks to that movie, like Mom, right? <laughs> yeah, most of you know some movies are really great. I was talking about that. And I was telling the students, well, if you kill someone, I'll tell you watch the mom and then you've got the idea, not from Dr. Rose. But anyway, so the thing is they got the crushed apple seed. So why that guy eating apple seed? Is there any crazy person who will go and eating the apple seed? I mean, I also explain that's why you have to came, come to Dr. Gose's biology class to learn more so that you don't go eating the apple seed. So the neighbors told that this <coughs> lady used to go to the neighborhood collecting all the apple seeds. Do you eat apple? Yes. Few only seeds you get, but so you collect one full cup of apple seed because the poor husband ate the apple pie earlier and he liked the crunchy apple seeds and he requested the wife, poison me, well not poison me, he did not know. <laughs> so get the apple seeds, roast it and mix with apple pie and he ate that and died. But thanks to forensic biology first time, it, he, she was rescued and relieved. Next one. So again DNA barcoding like a sexual as some case as it's showing the match like any kind of substance they collect blood or semen anything like that and they can map clearly and that's pointing the common the same kind of barcoding and pointing to the suspect number one next one please so almost done so matching the <clears throat> creating a dna profile using the basic molecular biology protocols and then pro, you know population genetics to prove that match mathematically next one uh, I'll skip that one and go further. I think that's it. So now I would take the questions and also talk more, more about the career counseling. And if you have any question, I'll try to answer. Why, right, please? Okay, sir. In the beginning of the session, you are talking about the Alzheimer's disease. Right. So Alzheimer's disease, uh, nowadays, it's, uh, we are already studying various type of model, mouse models, and Rosicla models. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, actually, what uh, the lab, many labs are now trying to do the mini organoids development, where to study the particular uh, special type of diseases. So in this particular case, a neural uh, regenerative techniques can be used uh, to actually uh, cure the Alzheimer's disease because C. elegans are already used up. So can this uh, regenerative disease? Definitely. Neuro regeneration could be a nice technique. Uh, nowadays, it's done with the treatment like disabled limbs and all those that are quite a few successful cases over there. But again, we have to keep in mind what level of Alzheimer's is there. Uh, remember I mentioned 31 mutations. If 29 mutations are there, it's almost no case. It will be like less, you know, mild as the dementia can be treated in that way. Neural regeneration could substitute those neurons, lost neurons, and bringing it back. I am uh, really optimistic about that. You saw the picture. I mean, we had never thought about that blood disorder like leukemia could be cured. And she is totally, that girl is totally devoid of any leukemia. It's a good news to the, you know, world over there. And then so it can be definitely. I'm, I'm really uh, optimistic about neuro regeneration. Yes, yeah, sir, could uh, be one. Thing. One thing, sir. But uh, now it is microcephaly. This microcephaly actually in Kolkata. Zika virus. Zika virus induced mm -hmm. microcephaly. Mm -hmm. This is actually happening in Kolkata also now. Five patients, were, small babies are reported. So these mini organoids can it can be actually helpful for that particular uh, transplantation of uh, for that particular uh, microcephaly cases. I I got your I got your point. It is not that easy when it is like you know kind of it is difficult to regenerate we are like so much like well built as human being you can transplant the organ but total system it will be very very difficult in particularly in case of microcephaly um, so lots of work has to be done I can tell you that yes. mm -hmm. anyone would like to ask yes you may ask you are free to ask from the talk otherwise in the area of biotechnology Now the director, sir, uh, asked me to talk a little bit about uh, career counseling. If anybody has such question, definitely I'd like to answer. Yes, please. So first, I would like to thank you for that wonderful session. And another thing, I just want to ask you: What steps 
biologists take in a crime scene, if uh, enough DNA fingerprint cannot be collected, uh, as the DNA is not isolated enough due to evidence tampering. Okay, yeah, that's that's a very good question. In fact, if you remember about the O.J. Simpson case in United States at that time, if you look at mid 90s at that time, um, my genetics professor, Dr. Benjamin. He was the expert in that case. So when he was teaching in the class, he talked about like the DNA got like contaminated. That's one major problem in molecular biology area. You need to understand it has to be extremely pure. Like that much pure, no contamination between anything. Like one day I entered into the lab and I was a little late, so I was running and I started sweating. My senior postdoc over there, Dr. Broyd, he just said, you just go over, sit over there, and when you stop sweating, come over here. Because a little drop of sweat gets into our microfuge tube, will destroy all these things. Because our sweat contains RNAs that destroys the RNA. So what I'm trying to say, like as you said, like little, even if you, nowadays it's possible with this PCR technique, high level of PCR, we can get like three, four hairs or a drop of blood or any kind of body fluid. If we can get only little sample, it is possible using that DNA amplification is done. So you can make enough DNA from that, that's why DNA amplification or this PCR technique. So you can get enough material from that little DNA to later match with other you know, uh, by DNA fingerprinting, it is possible. So that's the solution, like PCR thing. Now, the major thing, as I mentioned, you have to check for so that there is no contamination. There are such few such cases where, like, canine DNA got mixed with Homo sapiens or human, and that was very difficult to find. You know, the thing. So yes, but it is possible nowadays if you have pure DNA, the things can be done. And also another thing like DNA is kind of resistant and it lasts for a long time. So even from the crime scene, we can, there are cases like where DNA was collected, tissue samples were collected later, our blood samples were collected, and then later the uh, crime was solved. Anybody else? Anybody would like to? From this, yes. yeah, why you say DNA is more resistant than RNA? Yeah, because the double strand. Yeah. By the way, I uh, would like to introduce my PhD supervisor from here, University of Calcutta, Professor Omiyang Shu Chatterjee, with whom I work. And then, yes. Thank you, sir, for coming. Yes. So I learned genetics from him first time in his lab and everything I did the work. Go ahead. Are Single stranded. They have the <clears throat> also. Are they yeah, the other thing is that uh, in biological molecules, macromolecules, as you look at, interesting part is more simpler you are, you can change yourself faster. Think about COVID. It's a, a positive strand of RNA. Now, people are asking question, how come just one ended, how come another got mutated so fast? The answer to that, because that is RNA. And that's RNA virus. RNA can yeah. as a yes, ribozyme. Yeah. I, I did not bring it. There are so much things like it will take six hours and everybody will. So ribozyme is something which was discovered by Thomas Kick, uh, 1982, and he received his group and later he received Nobel Prize for that. Ribozymes answer the question in molecular biology. Like we ask the question, which one is first, chicken or the egg? So DNA or RNA? So his theory proves it's not DNA, but RNA was the first one. And what happened with the RNA, that works like, you know, as catalytic enzyme, which we call ribozyme. So RNA can produce the enzyme, they can change themselves. That answers to your question. That answers to your question, why RNA got, I think I talked about in my lecture, that time COVID was not there, 2018, right? And you attended that lecture in USA. All the so, RNA bacteria, the no, virus also. Virus, yes. Mm -hmm. Look for the hepatitis C virus. Right, There's right, no right. Vaccination. Yeah. 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 Because they change like anything, you know. 
the I problem is they change so fast. Mutation is something. Like I was invited in uh, Saudi Arabia 2019 and uh, in, in World Infectious Disease Conference. And there were people from NIH as well. So all of them are there and I was asking a question in the discussion that <clears throat> when we get the flu vaccine, now it is here also, say the flu vaccine is given in our area in Texas in October 1st onward because that's the flu season when it starts. But the flu vaccine was made at NIH, National Institute of Health, maybe in February or March. How about by that time the flu virus got mutated quite a few times and it's not what? I know many physicians, friends over there, they don't take any vaccine over their flu vaccine because they said we get more sick, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because sometimes that strain attacks the patient who that one got mutated quite a few times against which the vaccine was made, it's not working now. The same story started for COVID. Fortunately, it is a little down over there and it, again, it started in China. So it's kind of scary. Earlier it was like people used to think, well, it is happening in the other country. We don't have to worry. You have to worry much, which United States did not care that about and one million died. It's unthinkable. I remember we were coming back from a conference from Texas A&M College Station. So basically at that time only 11 cases were there. So I was taking nine students and coming back. And they were preparing in the college station with all the apron, mask and everything. But nobody could thought about that what was going to happen. So this RNA virus still now changing and it's in nature. It's a molecule. The worst part about those viruses, they can stay, they can retain as the dart, piece of dart on the table for a long time. And there is a viral theory on the, you know, cars of mommy, if you watch the movie nowadays. <clears throat> so basically, when uh, Howard Carter entered, uh, you know, all of his colleagues and slowly they died. So there is a viral theory. For 4,000 years, those viruses were there. And when they opened the door, they released all of them, you know, got contaminated with that virus that caused their death. Something like that, you know, some scientific explanation. So, any any other question? Yes, go ahead, please. Sir, I was asking that uh, in the snow as well that are melting nowadays, so that also contains many uh, bacteria which could be released in the atmosphere and it could uh, it, it could be my, my mutated or not but then it could hamper our daily lives. Uh, from where it is really safe again? The snow from uh, Arctic and Antarctic Ocean. Oh, yes, 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 definitely, definitely. Yes, that's, hopefully the scientists will take um, major care about it. Yes, the, we are always susceptible into that area. Like I'm talking about Wuhan, I did not visit Wuhan, but when I visited China, Honestly speaking, their laboratory was not that Z plus or Z plus, what we call category here. Because these types of work has to be done in what they call in the uh, United States, Z plus category. Only selected personnel after two, three doors check. You can enter, that's one thing. And then you work over there with extreme care and you will be recorded every moment. The theory that it was released from Wuhan laboratory could be there and you are right in Antarctica, you know, anywhere it is happening. Before you release anything, you have to be extremely careful because of those germs. I had a project came, like say that was multi-million dollar project against bioterrorism I just mentioned, but I refused that because few weeks back we saw on the TV a professor from Texas Tech University where I also served as adjunct he was arrested and after teaching 27 years because some of his students just contaminated everything and some of the cultures were lost. So he got arrested, his career was gone. So fortunately we didn't do any contamination in your lab when you had students. So that is definitely, you have to be careful because before releasing any kind of resources of microbial organism, germs and everything. Sir, uh, as you said that uh, by just uh, modifying the basis, uh, we can treat leukemia. Why don't we use this kind of technique in uh, like uh, deadly diseases like skin cancer or COVID to that modify uh, basis and we can just change, uh, treat the disease? 
two answers to that. Number one, it just came out, as I said, seven days back, I was watching the BBC News, and I found that one, which I presented. Now, so it is the first case in the world that happened that cured the little girl from the base changed um, cells were inserted. So hopefully, definitely later, this technique will be applied and very widely could be used. That's one thing. Second point, you have to think about money. So these kind of techniques could cost like million dollars or even in pounds close to that. So when it is available, you know, to the common people, then only it can be done, which I think we have to long way to go. Any other question? Any, anyone would like to? So um, I will just take one more minute, two more minutes to explain like those who are interested definitely work with the area. Um, like I can tell you, you can pick up the subject of yours. Subject of yours. Nowadays it is possible that you switch from the area of physics to biology, biology to physics, biophysics. So my supervisor, uh, she had a, at Baylor College of Medicine, she had a PhD in physics and she was working in the area of neuroscience. So that's really uh, amazing that how we interchange our ideas. So first thing I would tell you, whatever you are studying, wherever, what area you are studying, concentrate on that and try to do your best because it is India from where we get the best type of students uh, in, in all over the world. Wherever I go, I visit, I see. I had many nine students came from, you know, went from India and they did excellent and they are very, very successful in their lives, uh, opening diagnostic library, laboratories and everything like that. So firstly target which subject you like. It is very important and we had quite a few number of things happened in our school also. Very talented, very nice student. And if he could go in the area of studying arts or something and getting into IAS or choice, his choice, he could do excellent. He was good in English and we miss that friend, our uh, you know, good friend. So, but he was forced to go to the area of engineering. When a kid is born in the country called India, the mother and father, the parents always dream, my kid is going to be a doctor or engineer. Sorry, there are other professions. As you, see, as you have seen in my designation, I'm advisor. I advise for biology education in the United States, uh, in wherever you know I'm teaching. So earlier, the parents used to come and they will tell they will impose their ideas on their kids. No, she's going to be a doctor. And after the parents left, I figured out she does not have any, uh, you know, likings for those subject areas. And she can do good in the other area. So let you select, let others select your subject, whatever you like. And you can do your level best. That's my point. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir, for uh, very informative and very connective insights, very important topics of the biotechnology. In fact, all these students, they have been studying in their curriculum. Particularly our lab students, they have been doing these techniques like genomic isolation, after genomic DNA isolation, downstream techniques such as uh, agarose gel electroporosis, restriction digestion, polymerase chain reactions. So they have been doing it. Now through this research session, they also got to know that the vast applications after these techniques, how these techniques are, you know, beyond the you know limits are actually executed in the in the in the in the fields of uh, medicine and agriculture and the biotechnology area. So this is really actually really informative and uh, exciting session and very important uh, areas of the biology biotechnology starting from the concept of the DNA and then PCR invention about Kari Miller's and then how much struggle he was taking during that time and then its uh, proceedings followed by RDNA technology 
and DNA barcoding and personal DNA medicines which are in the process uh, maybe in the future days now we will see actually how it is shaping up is uh, one more actually important area you have touched upon touched it and followed by very important uh, topics nowadays we are coming across like uh, uh, this is microbio and microbiota gut microbiota especially so uh, that is another important topic you have highlighted and transposons you students all you know read about this transposons and actually the scientist began barbara mcclintock so who how she was actually experimenting with that and followed by human genome projects and its uh, applications like genome human genome projects how it is helping us to tackle the you know genetic diseases and all that its applications and the karyotyping and this dna technology application in the forensics actually the dna fingerprinting it's very you know huge uh, you know a topic it's been covered in a such a uh, you know sim uh, sim uh, simple duration that is in one hour mostly that means so uh, and not only that apart from that you have also you know uh, suggest to students actually if they are aspiring to become a biologist and bio biotechnologist what should they will be doing they should be doing so such kind of you know informative in a talk so um, we as uh, before i proceed to word of thanks i would also like to emphasize as our director emphasis in the beginning so bitm actually has been popular in the science since 1959 but especially practical biotechnology is been uh, popular in bitm since inception of this laboratory it was established in 2017 since then we have been popularizing practical biotechnology as well this lab facility is not only extended for the like you know members of the lab but also for non members as well that we are actually extending through various kinds of programs like in this year only we have conducted uh, many kinds of practical uh, workshops and training programs in the month of june we have conducted molecular biology microbiology techniques for the undergraduate students followed by this with uh, department of uh, science and technology biotechnology government of west bengal we also you know conducted a very useful workshop on the mushroom cultivation mark by the techniques for the undergraduate students in the month of december in this month only in the first week only for the school students because school students they do have this one this curriculum and the higher secondary uh, curriculum that is for them also we conducted one hands on workshop in the biotech in the first week and today with this this program so this is how we are trying to actually popularize you know biotechnology Uh, not only the, in the area of theory, but also in the practical biotechnology, so to the possible extent. So uh, we we are at the uh, <coughs> end of the lecture session. So uh, it is indeed my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. So I express my sincere gratitude and thanks. Thank you, uh, thanks for uh, Prof Professor Navaran Goes for having come from all the way. Despite his busy schedule, taken time out and coming uh, to the lab and uh, delivering the talk. and covering the many aspects and for the guidance so we are uh, our sincere thank you sir and we hope to see you we look forward to have you with us in our future endeavors similar endeavors as well and uh, i also uh, thank all the parents who are the backbone of this laboratory because they are sending their you know to uh, their words here to learn something so so we are trying our level best to give the practical experience to them uh, parents and the students who have been sincerely You no know, students. Most of the students we notice in the laboratory, not they simply take the membership. Sincerely, they come, they try to learn. So, with the same, uh, I uh, I must say that I must appreciate your you know sincerity. So, keep continue the same spirit. And uh, thanks for coming to for today's session. And the uh, uh, press and print media and colleagues who are present here express sincere uh, thanks to everybody. So, this lesson session is now is it it is concluded. so follow with this session we have hands on activity session for these students students members so we'll be led by the professor navarun goes with this i conclude today's session